All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to, um, to our session. I'm uh, competing against Lee Hood is a tough, uh, a tough gig, and I look forward to watching the whole video. I was enjoying the first few minutes of that talk. Um, but this is a very different, um, a very different sort of environment. So, um, very happy to have you all here. Um, I'm Lee Buckler. I'll be moderating the session today. Feel a little bit embarrassed that we don't have a patient on the stage um, or a patient um, advocate or family. So, what we're really going to do is depend on patients, patient families, um, and doctors in the audience to really represent that position. Because what we're going to do today is I'm going to try and set the framework for this topic a little bit. And then Alan and, Wu, uh, Alan and, and Paul are both going to give their perspectives on, um, on, on, on this issue. And then we're going to have a, a discussion. And we'll have a discussion as long as you want until the time ends. And if you don't want to have a discussion, uh, we'll end early. But I'm hoping that we have a good discussion. Because it's a topic that's highly contextualized. It's highly personal. And we all have um, very unique perspectives, and it's certainly not a, a topic that's, that's black and white. It's, um, and it's why it's such a fascinating topic. Um, you know, for me, I have the luxury of treating this topic as, you know, philosophically, intellectually interesting. But I know for a lot of you, this is a very, very personal journey. And, um, and, that's, um, and that's an important aspect of this, uh, of this whole debate and this whole issue. So um, we'll kick off. We'll, uh, we'll have these three uh, snapshots of perspectives after I sort of set the tone. And, um, and then we'll just engage in a, in a wide-ranging discussion. And I'm assuming, um, Jason, we have a mic, right, for when we want to do discussions? Perfect. So he'll roam around with the mic um, when we're at that point. So I know, you know, for a lot of people, the particular perspective of the speaker or the author is very important on this topic because there's a lot of allegations of conflict of interest with people's, with, with the way people frame the debate and the way they talk about the issues. So um, I don't do this to talk so much about myself as much as to give you a sense of the perspective I'm bringing to the way I will talk about the subject today. So I've been in the cell therapy industry since 2000. I'm not here by education. I'm here by osmosis. Um, I'm a lawyer by profession. Um, did that for three years, looked down the hall, and thought there must be more interesting ways to make a living, and I found it in cell therapy. Um, so I've done a bunch of different things, um, project management, association management, conference management, business development, and now for the past five years, I've been a consultant in the space, and I work largely for companies largely for companies which in the U.S. fall under the 351 category, um, uh, for tools and service companies, um, but I'm certainly not um, certainly um, um, uh, 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 well-versed in, the, um, in, in, the, in the full range of the, of the sector. And um, for those of you who might be familiar, I have a blog in which I've blogged about this topic a fair amount, and I suppose is one of the reasons why I'm on the, on the podium today. And you can go back into the archives of my blog and look at my particular perspectives. I, we also end up talking a lot about this topic on uh, the LinkedIn group that I started some years ago, which is called the LinkedIn Cell Therapy Industry Group. And it was meant to be, you know, originally meant to be um, people with a professional interest in, the, in, in, in cell therapy. Um, and what we have benefited from, I would say largely over the past year, is from patients engaging in a very active discussion on that topic and bringing their very important perspective to, um, you know, uh, the, the the topics of uh, related to the cell therapy industry. And so I would encourage you, if you're not there, um, to uh, to to join and participate in that discussion. For those of you who are on Twitter, I'm I'm at Cell Therapy. I'm also involved in the Alliance for Regenerative Medicine, which is an, uh, largely an industry organization, but it has, um, a, a, I think, a very proper and active role for patients and patient advocacy and patient um, advocacy groups. Um, and we want to try and encourage that more and then something of an entrepreneur on the side. I am, as a, as a, as a matter of disclosure, on the board of directors of an autologous adult stem cell therapy, I suppose you would describe it in some way, but it's a blood-derived um, therapeutic, uh, intended to be uh, used in an autologous fashion, um, which is, uh, falls under the 351 category because it's, uh, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a manufactured product. 
So we've ever so slightly changed the title of this uh, session today to be what you, want, you might want to know before considering. And I think the original title was before getting. And we certainly want to leave open the option that you know, after doing your due diligence, you may not want to get. You may want, you may, you may want to do other things. But certainly we want to frame this debate that there are lots of patients who at least want to consider getting a treatment which at the end of the day is considered by many to be not compliant with the regulatory framework in which they're being provided. Um, and so that's, uh, that's the slight tweak we've made to the title. The way that I want to frame the, deba the, 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 the discussion today is that, that we collectively, as an industry, as patient advocacy groups, as anybody who's passionate about this sector, we need to do more to help patients, patients' families, patients' physicians understand um, how to make informed, um, important decisions that are relevant to their own very personal health care, very personal context of their own health, their own risk analysis, and their own finances. And I, I'm a firm believer, for those of you who, who have followed my blog at all, that we, as an industry at least, I can say, because I'm very much a part of it, have not done enough. And I've been um, I'm trying to frame um, uh, an action um, a, a protocol, if you will, for how we can do more. So um, this particular session, I prefer not to be about whether or not to buy compliant or not compliant. There's lots of people who will try and, 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 and tell you never, ever, you mustn't ever consider a treatment which is not compliant. Um, that's a legitimate viewpoint, and it may be, and may be the right viewpoint, but it's not, the, it's not the, the only way to look at the world, and it's not the way we're going to look at the world today in this session. Um, this is not about whether we can or should fight the existence of things which are not compliant. There's, there's, there, there, there is a, uh, a, a, that's a debate one could have about whether or not the FDA, we're going to have a very U.S.-centric um, discussion today um, because we're here in the U.S., whether or not they've drawn the line in the sand the right place and whether or not there's anything we could do to change where they've drawn the line in the sand. That's a very important debate that we should have. It's not necessarily the, the discussion we're going to have today. Um, there are certainly lots of ways to optimize the regulations and, and or their enforcement of the regulations. Um, those, those need to be looked at. We need to address those in industry. That's not particularly what we're here to address today. And what I really want to try and avoid also today, because I just don't think it's particularly instructive um, or constructive, is to really pose this as an us versus them. We're not here to engage in great conspiracy theories about how the pharmaceutical industry is out to attack all of us and to make great gobs of money at our expense. Um, because I just don't think, it may be true, but I just don't think framing the discussion in that way is particularly useful. So I don't think we're really here to talk about how, uh, you know, th th we're the little guys fighting big bad pharma or the big bad embryonic stem cell scientists or the big bad uh, induced pluripotent scientists or the big bad FDA or to you know, all these alleged conflicts of interest. We all have conflicts of interest. We all have perspectives we bring to this discussion. They're all important. They all should be listened to. And there are honest, legitimate, very caring people on all sides of this discussion. So I'm not, partic not going to be particularly tolerant of that kind of, that kind of way to, to frame um, what I'm hoping will be a very, a very useful discussion. What I am very passionate about is trying to find meaningful, practical solutions which are helpful to patients and their care providers to help them in the real-life context of their decision about whether or not to engage in this decision, this very important decision, um, to, to, to buy a non-compliant cell-based treatment. So my particular efforts and my particular focus, as you'll see today, is based on, 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 on the perspective that we should approach this as most industry and even regulators approach life, and this is a risk-based analysis. So there, are, there is a wide spectrum of, of, of even not compliant cell-based treatments. Um, and, 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 and there's a, a, a wide array of risks, a wide array of, 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 of efficacy. And um, what I believe we all should be doing is try to steer our, our family, our friends, our colleagues, anybody we can touch away from the worst offenders. That's at least what we can do. Let's at least do that. Um, 
so the, the discussion that, I want to, that I'm trying to frame and the initiatives that I'm trying to push are ones which aren't about distinguishing the difference between compliance and not compliance, because everybody can do that, and that's, that's the easy one to do, and there's lots of people doing that from their academic ivory towers and, and regulators doing that. But what we need to do is try and, and distinguish between the, 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 the risky and the dangerous and the silly and the, and the, and the scandalous non-compliance, and those which have less scandal, less risk, and, and, and probably, maybe, even, hopefully, some scientific medical credibility, which, which can be useful to you. So um, this is not a binary ethical decision. This is not black and white. This is, there's a lot of shades of gray. And, and, and I think there's also a lot of evidence of double standards in a way that a lot of people talk about this language. Um, and so, um, and I think it's important to note that as we, as, we, as we talk about it. A couple of other points, I think, you know, this, this discussion used to be very much framed as a medical tourism discussion because most non-compliant treatments were being provided offshore. So it was about recruiting American patients to be treated in every other jurisdiction, which was basically a vacuum of, of regulatory um, of jurisdiction or regulatory framework. Um, and I, I have a number of, 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 of views about that. There's nothing inherently wrong. My starting position is there's nothing inherently wrong with medical tourism. There's nothing inherently wrong with traveling somewhere else to, per, to, per, to receive a medical treatment. There's, so there's, and if that's true, and if you accept that's true, then there's nothing inherently wrong with stem cell medical tourism. Um, um, what, what then becomes the issue is why is the company there? Are they there because they're taking advantage of a regulatory vacuum that they can then are allowed to do just exactly what they want? Or are they there for some business or commercial reasons, which is often the case with medical tourism? And the other thing is that this is, this is a, a becoming an increasingly irrelevant way to frame the debate. This is not so much about medical tourism anymore unless you know, tourism is traveling from, from Utah to Denver. Um, this is a, this is a very much an American issue now. There are, there are, there are all, there is a growing, an exponentially growing number of clinics providing treatments which the FDA and many industry people would say are not compliant with the current regulatory framework right here in, in, in the United States of America. And so uh, to frame the issue around medical tourism, I think, is now, is now, a, a dist is now, is now not the right way to frame the, the discussion. There's also, I, I believe, and we can open this, this will be, this will be the, the, perhaps one of the most um, 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 uh, contentious things that I say. I, I, I don't, I, I'm not entirely convinced that there's something unethical about charging for experimental treatments. I think that there is potentially a way to do that which is ethical, which is proper, um, and, 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 and can be done, and, and certainly whether or not that's true, there are now a number of emerging examples of academics in, engaged in clinical trials who have charged or are charging for, um, for clinical trials. So I think that there's a way to do this which is, which is proper. So I don't think necessarily that someone is charging is evidence of a flagrance of ethics. Um, so that's my position, and, and we can engage in that discussion. It's also, I don't think, necessarily about providing unproven therapies or treatments, because I think there's lots of examples, even in the American medical system, where it's completely legal, compliant, and ethical to provide treatments which are not necessarily highly proven. Um, and H, uh, the, the, the human, uh, the, the device exemption for, de um, uh, for, for devices, off-label drug prescriptions, um, all kinds of alternative medicines, um, even the HCTPs, you know, cell treatments under 361. There's not, a, there's not an evidentiary burden for those treatments being, being brought to market. You can bring those products relatively straight to market. And the government, you know, the FDA has designed that on purpose. They've, they've, they've designed, they've said there's not, an, there's not a, a, a proof, an efficacy proof barrier to bringing those, those, those treatments to market. So I don't think it's also very useful to talk about, the, to frame the discussion around whether it's proven or unproven. There's also, as you know, lots of things which are proven um, to, be, uh, to be efficacious and allegedly safe and, and approved to be on the market, which cause, at the end of the day, a great deal of harm. So proof is, is very contextual. So um, I, I have proposed in the past six steps of, and you know, I say fighting because I think we need, to, we need as I said, to fight 
the most egregious examples of, 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 of these non-compliant cell treatments and help patients distinguish, right? So fighting is a strong word. Um, it may not be the best word to have chosen for this, for this topic, but five, six steps to you know, be helpful, let's say, in, in, in addressing this issue of non-compliant cell treatments. And this is taken from a blog post that I did some, some while ago, so you don't need to read all of this. You can go to my blog and see it. But the, the first step, I think, is, is you know, like most six steps or nine steps or ten step programs, is you know, a, 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 recogni a, a recognition of, um, of, of that, that there's a problem, right? So this is not a problem, and it's not a problem of black and white. It's a problem of a lot of gray. Um, and so, you know, decision number one is do you, do you only want to restrict yourself to compliant treatments or, or also to non-compliant treatments? And then decision two, if you're going to go down the, at least investigating that non-compliant route, then it, it, it really rests on you as a physician, as a family, as a, as a patient to try and distinguish, try and do some risk-based analysis of, 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 of whether the particular treatment you're looking at um, raises, uh, you know, 50 red flags or five. Right? And, 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 and our job as an industry, as a collective, as a, as a collective of people who are passionate about this topic, is to try and create tools which don't exist today, which I'm passionate about wanting to try and create, S tools which will help address whether a particular treatment or clinic or product raises five flags or 50. Um, so the, the, one, one example that I've used in discussions with people, and I don't use these um, to, to, to suggest that either of these are necessarily on one end of the spectrum or another, but on the one hand, you've got a clinic like Okunos Heart Institute in the Bahamas, which as I understand it, their business model is intended to, 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 to center around the treatment of heart patients who, um, um, who you know, have to prove to be eligible to the trial, um, and they're going to treat them in a pr using the Satori system once the Satori system has a CE mark in Europe to treat those exact same patients, right? So here's a business which says, A, we're going to limit, we're going to limit the number of the, the, the treatments we provide. We don't have a laundry list of, of, of indications we're treating, right? We can't treat everything. We're going to focus on what there is some scientific and medical evidence of efficacy for and safety for. We're going to only provide um, treatments in a way which is already approved in some other jurisdiction, right? So my uncle could go to Germany and get this same treatment, um, or he could fly to Bahamas and get it, you know, because he's a sick, he's a sick guy and he doesn't want to fly so far, and you know. Um, um, and there's, so there's scientific evidence, there's medical evidence, there's already regulatory approval in some jurisdiction, um, and they limit themselves to eligible patients, et cetera, et cetera. They're charging, it's a total stem cell tourism play, they're charging for it, it's, it's not, there's no, there's not a clinical trial, this is, this is, this is, this is a business, right? So, on the one, and I don't, and I don't paint them as the poster child of everything that's perfect, but, but they are clearly, in my mind, sitting on one end of the spectrum, which raises, certainly fewer less flags than the guy pricking stem cells in a back alley in Mexico in your thumb. Okay, there's, there's a lot of room between this company and that guy. And so we have to find ways to distinguish between this guy and that and that in, in, in all instances. That's my only point. The other is as an industry, and I've, I, I, when, I, when, I, when I created this blog, I was creating it to my industry colleagues, it's not that useful to just sit in your academic lab and wave your finger and say, Yo, no, you mustn't. You mustn't ever do anything like this. You must only participate in a clinical trial, and, um, and that's the end of the debate. Um, that's an that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a informed perspective. It's a, I don't take anything away from that perspective. That's, a, that's, a, that's certainly a safe perspective to have. Um, but I don't think it's a particularly useful one um, for people who are in the position of having to consider these kinds of treatments. The other is, as I've said before, all of life is based on a risk-based analysis. So why not approach this topic on, on that same way? The other is that it's not about tourism, and the other is that we need to take collective responsibility. And then, um, and then, um, you know, uh, what I'm proposing, which I've already um, sort of steal, stolen my own thunder, is that we, as a collective, patient groups, professional groups, industry groups, I don't know who needs to do this, and I haven't figured that out yet, but we need to, as a collective, figure out some way to provide more useful <coughs> risk analysis tools for, for patients and their families and their care providers. And I think that that looks something like a web-based tool. I think it walks patients through a number of, of, of critical issues to consider, critical questions to ask. 
um, and, and gives them some mechanism to score in the context of their own health, in the context of their own finances, in the context of their own risk aversion, how they would, um, ans based on the answers they get when they ask you know, um, uh, these questions, to, to score themselves where they think these, this particular product or treatment or clinic sits. And, and, and by, by virtue of walking through this tool, having, have, have made a more informed decision than you might have made without it. And, and, and so that doesn't put me, it doesn't put an, a, some professional organization in the judge and jury seat deciding your fate. It puts you, it, it drives the, the, the patients and the patients' families and their, and their doctors and physicians and even specialists in, in, in that seat and just helps them hopefully make a better decision. So that's, um, that's, that's, the, that's my uh, 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 focus and strategy and perspective. And now we will invite Alan up to, um, to give his perspective as a, as a physician. And I've asked each of these guys to do the same um, as I've done and give you um, a context of who they are so you know um, the context to put um, uh, their opinions in. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, I, my name is Dr. Alan Wu. I'm an actively practicing regenerative surgeon. And uh, here are my disclosures. Uh, I work as a uncompensated medical consultant for these following entities. And uh, my, my task today is to be the lone clinician to be the sacrificial lamb and sit in the dunk tank and take all the rotten tomatoes if you wish. Um, I'm sometimes asked to explain what is going on in the wacky world of uh, stem cell therapy and what's going on in the minds of the clinician. And I'll be very honest with you, sometimes I don't even understand. Uh, but there needs to be some practical advice to be given to families and friends and individuals that are seeking therapy and practical ways in which we as clinicians can improve the field and improve our credibility with patients and the public. Um, so the first thing, you know, and I'm just going to go through these simple slides and, and just give very simple advice. Um, the first thing that you should know of uh, when you go out there and you're looking at potential uh, clinics and places of therapy is that officially there really is no true board certification in stem cell medicine right now as it stands. At least in the United States, the American Board of Medical Specialties is responsible for um, pretty much vetting and anointing and deciding which specialties have the uh, legal authority and ability to say that they are board certified. It's a very long and laborious process actually and uh, does require an extreme amount of vetting and historically usually requires a, a very large consensus of physicians and surgeons uh, to finally enter into true board certification. When I show the following slide, usually half the room rolls their eyes, and then the other half of the room says, what, what's going on? And um, the A4M, which is an organization uh, that uh, was one of the first to actually start some sort of board certification process, uh, was trying to at least uh, provide early forms of education to physicians. And I, I know that there, there are some controversy regarding this organization, but one thing that I will say and, and although I'm not a member of the organization, one thing that I will say is they at least uh, try to set up some sort of framework of education for physicians. I will, I will comment that every year their knowledge base and their uh, ability and, their, um, and also their training uh, continues to improve. At this juncture, there is no other organization that really is providing for a board certification or exam-based method to vet or legitimate uh, physicians at this point. Um, so although the A4M does uh, uh, get some controversy, uh, it is one of the first. It may not be perfect, um, but I leave you to judge as to whether or not uh, you think it's valid based upon uh, looking at their website <coughs> independently. Uh, but the biggest complaint that we have seen regarding um, 
certification, board certification of any sort for regenerative therapies and people that are involved in regenerative therapies, uh, clinicians at least. One of the biggest concerns is this concept of almost neo-certification, where an individual somehow gets this distinction, and now all of a sudden they've gone from, you know, just a wild example here, they've gone from being the specialist of the left pinky, now all of a sudden being able to manage problems like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's with stem cells. Uh, you and I, in a common sense approach, would never bring your Honda in to the vet clinic to have it repaired, right? You gotta go to the right specialist. And, 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 that's, uh, and that's the most important thing, is that you, you need to go to the right specialist for the right reasons. And if you are going to receive some sort of stem cell therapy, it would behoove you to actually go to an organ-specific specialist. So if you've got a kidney problem, you might want to go to a nephrologist or renal specialist or urologist that actually has additional regenerative experience and not go to somebody who is, say for example, uh, the expert in the left pinky, okay? Use your common sense. Also, um, uh, when you're looking at therapies, you really should exhaust all standard medical care problems. If you are sitting in that room with that physician, and the first thing they tell you is, sure, go and lay down on my operating table and I'll do the stem cells immediately. That is the first sign that you need to get up and leave. Because that physician or surgeon really needs to go through a careful and meticulous history to know whether or not you have truly exhausted all medical options. So the roadblock shows you that you should, you should be at the very end of the road, okay? You have to exhaust all standards of medical care before you receive any sort of experimental therapy. And here's the other reason why you do need to have specific specialists in your area to understand whether or not you've exhausted all options. The expert in the left pinky isn't going to know diddly squat about all the therapies that are available for kidneys. So how are they going to know that you have exhausted all of your standard medical care options? This is the reason why we should not have lane changing in this field. We still need to have some semblance of specialization. And the other, the other important uh, issue to think about is whether or not the receipt of these experimental therapies might preclude you from any other meaningful studies. There are some other studies in, in the United States and abroad that will say, if you've received any other form of therapy, we're not going to allow you into that study. So this is why I keep saying, make sure that you've completely exhausted all your options. And if you're thinking about enrolling in an NIH study or some other university-based study, you need to look at the fine print and make sure that you would not be precluded if you receive this other therapy overseas or in the United States. Um, and then uh, also make sure that if you are going to be receiving any further surgical procedures like a heart transplant or a kidney transplant, that your team that is supposed to work with you is not going to preclude you from any further surgery if you receive some sort of stem cell therapy. And I encourage uh, anyone and everyone to talk candidly with your physicians uh, because they need to really know what is in your body at the time in which they're gonna be doing that surgery. Uh, there are some people that are on transplant lists and although I have never heard of anybody being kicked off a transplant list for receiving a stem cell therapy, I know that there are some transplant surgeons that are concerned about the issue of uh, interaction with the immune suppressants or, or other therapies. Uh, and this is the reason why we need to have an open and transparent process when we're starting to combine these different modalities in medicine because it just gets too confusing. The doctors in the room will tell you, yeah, you know, I had to operate on somebody and she didn't tell me about the heparin she was on and she bled like crazy. You know, happens all the time. You have to be open and dispassionate with your surgeon. Also, you should look for these three symbols uh, for any institution or clinic that you're receiving therapy from. IRB, that stands for Institutional Review Board. This means that basically the protocol that you will be receiving has been reviewed, vetted by experts peer experts that are trying to determine whether or not it is, number one, ethical, and two, safe to actually go through with these studies. 
And even if you're receiving therapy overseas, there are clinics that will actually submit their protocol to an IRB, a formal IRB, and get it approved. And you as a patient have a right to actually ask for the minutes and the details regarding the IRB protocol, and I would insist that you do that as well. Finally, an IRB is not the FDA or any regulatory authority's issuance of an approval, okay? There's a difference between something being allowed and something being approved, okay? FDA approval is like a seal of approval, something that's allowed, like an IRB study that's allowed to occur, is more like a permission slip for the study to be done. So never confuse the two. And finally, if your clinician is telling you, yes, you can bill your insurance company, I would be very careful about that. To my knowledge, there are very few, if any, stem cell therapies that are actually allowed uh, billable by the insurance companies. Even bone marrow transplantation, which has been around for a very long time, still falls under contention. My recommendation to you is to take the procedure that you're about to receive, and if they're saying that it could be allowed by the insurance company, actually go to your insurance company yourself and see if it is something that is uh, allowed under your benefits. And lastly, uh, a lot of people wonder, well, if I spend more, will I be getting more? And what is concerning is that I actually talked to a group out of China, and apparently there is a very uh, private and uh, quiet uh, uh, clinic in Europe that is actually offering stem cell therapy for a million dollars. And, and I, I, I thought to myself, what are they, wh how are they charging a million dollars? Do they have like gold-plated toilets in their clinic, or what's going on? And, you know, my, my issue is that, look, you know, whether it's porcelain or gold, you know, it'll work just fine. Uh, if somebody's telling you it's going to cost you a million dollars or an exorbitant amount of money, that should be a warning sign to you. I will say parenthetically that it looks like internationally the average procedure fee is somewhere around $30,000 for a stem cell procedure. Uh, some of the IRBs that are happening on the state side that are being self-financed are carrying their fees somewhere under 10,000. So that should give you a rough estimation for uh, whether or not you might be getting ripped off. And finally, if your uh, clinician is promising you the moon and saying that they can permanently cure and eradicate and solve all your problems with this one stem cell procedure, you should get out of the room and run. There are no such things as promises in medicine. Even when we are counseling patients on standard therapies, we tell them blatantly and honestly, there are no guarantees. And above all, the most important degree that you should be looking at in all of this is your own, which is the degree in common sense, okay? We all need to have a PhD in simple common sense. If it's too good to be true, it probably is. And please be careful. Uh, lastly, sources of information. Uh, these are what are considered peer-reviewed and, uh, and very good sources of information that can serve as a backbone uh, to gaining more information off the Internet. The Food and Drug Administration, NIH, and CIRM, and ISSCR are all very credible institutions uh, that actually have excellent sources of information. The only reason why I didn't list Paul and Lee's site is because they have worse jokes on their website than me. So, uh, actually, that's not true. Um, uh, Lee's website, uh, uh, the Cell Therapy Group, and uh, Paul Nofler's uh, website actually provide very good information as well. I will, I will just note parenthetically, please be careful of the comment section area because although a physician may comment in that area, um, you need to be careful uh, about uh, those comments because sometimes uh, they're, they're not exactly peer reviewed. Okay. And lastly, uh, I just want to touch on this issue of stromal vascular fraction. Uh, it's, it's kind of the hottest topic out there in uh, all of the clinics and, and all the stem cell therapy clinics. And the reason why is because there's an easy abundance of stem cells in fat. And stromal vascular fraction is not really a, a fat stem cell per se. If you took fat and you took out all of the adipose cells and, and you leave everything behind, Everything that's left behind is basically the SVF cells. And uh, it's kind of a, a funny model and way of doing things to some extent. You know, if, if you were to think of fat stem cells as apples, and if you were to tell somebody, well, we think that you're probably going to need apples to fix your problem, 
but we're going to give you the entire fruit stand, you would think that maybe that might not be a very good way of doing things. It might be kind of messy and dirty, but uh, there are some very interesting findings that are starting to perk up and develop overseas and in the States. Uh, but the question still remains, is, is it really a, a cornucopia of fruit that's being delivered, or is this kind of like a mixture of different firecrackers with the occasional pipe bomb hidden in it? Well, you know, at least what I'm seeing so far, it doesn't look like that's, that's what's panning out in the early data that's coming in. But this is the reason why we have to be careful. This is the reason why we have to have an open transparency about what we are doing in this field. And this is the reason why you should insist and make sure that the clinic that you are working with and under is, is working under an IRB because the regulatory authorities do have the ability to come in on random inspection to make sure that you're receiving appropriate care. Thank you. Thanks, Alan. That's, that's great to have that um, clinician perspective and some very good points. Um, so now I'm going to invite Paul Knopfler uh, up, uh, who uh, will also introduce himself and his, uh, his day job and his side job both, um, and, uh, and give you the benefit of his thoughts on the topic. So, hello everyone. Um, I think this is going to be a really interesting uh, discussion at the end. I'm hoping we'll get a lot of interaction between us and, and the audience. So, just by way of introduction, I'm the sort of ivory tower guy um, <laughs> of this group. So, if you don't like ivory tower people, you can throw your tomatoes at me. Um, but I should put a little asterisk on that in that I really think over the last few years, um, I've been getting out of the ivory tower a lot more. And in part, that's actually something I should thank patients for because um, I think because of the blog I have, this uh, IPSL.com. Let's see if I can get this to work. Just use the buttons, I think, on the oh, okay. It's easy. Um, like, yeah, the down arrow. Oh, okay. Oops. Yeah. Anyway, you can see it up there. Um, <laughs> Um, I've been getting now, and I should say I'm a PhD, but I've been getting about one patient contact per week now. It's really remarkable. So about 50, 60 a year. And so um, oftentimes these patient contacts, you know, it's a very emotional kind of situation. And I've, if you were at the dinner last night, you know I've been a cancer patient myself. And so I think I've really learned to appreciate the patient perspective on things and, and realize how important that is. Um, interestingly, also this year in particular, um, I have about one, pay, one contact per week with industry as well. And so that's really changed. And by industry, I don't mean like big pharma or anything like that. I mean mostly um, small companies that are interested in uh, getting into the stem cell field or they're already in the stem cell field. They've been in it for years and they just want to talk. And so I think um, this allows me to have a broader perspective on things just than the average academic. And, and I don't mean to criticize my uh, academic colleagues by any means, but I think most of them really need to get out of the lab more and realize what's really going on out there. And so my goal in my uh, talk today is to give you my perspectives, which of course are biased um, by my own background, I'll admit that, and um, really give you a sense of where I see things from the science perspective. And so I'm going to try not to be preachy or anything like that. Sometimes I do that on my blog a little bit, um, but today I'm not going to do that. Um, and so I'm going to go through some of the science, and I'm going to tell you what I think would be important questions for a patient or the loved one of a patient to ask a clinic or ask a physician who's in that clinic related to the certain scientific topics that I'm going to be going through. So in orange, you're going to see questions pop up that I think it would be helpful for you to think about asking um, the provider who is offering a certain treatment. So one thing um, I've realized in, in a lot of my interactions with patients and, and their family members is that they don't realize that, in many cases, the, um, the non-compliant treatments that they may be contemplating getting are really experiments. And of course, this could be in part my own bias because I think I kind of view the world as different kinds of experiments. 
Um, but really, when you get some kind of medical intervention, it is kind of an experiment because you're hoping for a certain outcome, like you're going to get better. Um, but we don't really know for sure going into it. And so, um, so that's something that patients should really keep in mind that in many cases what you're, what you're participating in, if you get a non-compliant kind of therapy, is really an experiment. And what we know is that even compliant clinical trials, um, most of the time they actually fail. And so even though a compliant quote-unquote trial might be based on uh, preclinical data, say in mice or rats or other animals, um, that give a certain level of confidence in a, a hypothesis, you know, in terms of safety and efficacy, most of the time they still fail anyway. And so I think if you decide to go the non-compliant route, you should realize that it's really, you know, I call it a shot in the dark. Maybe that's too harsh. Um, I don't know. But there's usually much less data there. And so if by comparison, even data-based compliant trials usually fail when you're doing something that really doesn't have a lot of data behind it, I think the odds of it working, and, that, and by that I mean really helping you in some kind of way that you can actually you know, tell it's helping you, I think it's a very low uh, chance that, that that's going to work. And so if you're getting, if you choose to get a non-compliant intervention, what, what's really happening is you're paying um, to be a research subject in an experiment. I think that's my perspective. You may not agree with it, but I think that's important to understand. Um, it's not necessarily that you're like a human guinea pig, but, um, but you are part of uh, something that is pretty risky. It's experimental. And so um, one thing that you could ask uh, a clinic or a provider is, you know, a simple question. Is my treatment an experimental treatment? You know, is this an experiment? And I would be very curious to see what that person, you know, what, what is their answer? Do they admit that this is an experimental kind of procedure? Or do they say, no, 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 you know, this is really established. It's a medical procedure, not, not an experiment. Um, this is, uh, now I'm getting into an area that's pretty controversial, um, and this is the area of uh, stem cell therapies that are based upon growing the stem cells in a lab before they're given to a patient. And so um, many of you may have heard of kind of a basic approach that's out there right now where you do like a micro liposuction, you get some fat, and then uh, for a couple weeks you grow those cells in culture, and then they're given back to the patient. And this is something that really concerns me. Um, there is a lot of controversy as to whether or not the end product there should be called uh, a biological drug or not. And, and that's not something I'm really going to touch on. I'm just going to talk about my perspectives um, as someone who's been a cell biologist for more than 20 years um, about what can happen when things are grown in a lab. And as someone who's spent a good chunk of my life in the lab, I know a lot of things can happen in the lab that are not necessarily good things. And, and so one thing I want to start out uh, pointing out is that cells are not really perfect copy machines. And this is, I think, something that's, that's a popular myth out there. And by this I mean when you have a single cell, and we all know that that cell then can divide and give you two cells, the two cells that we call the daughter cells, they're not identical to each other. That's a myth. And they're not identical to their mother cell from which they came. There are, in fact, differences between those cells. So uh, when a cell divides, I've got it up here, um, the two daughter's cells are not twins. They're not like identical twins. They might be more like fraternal twins. I think that's a better analogy. They're also not clones of the mother. And this is something that applies to cells kind of across the board. And then interesting, when you get to stem cells, uh, it turns out that stem cells are even more inclined um, to not be identical copy machines than the average cell, because many stem cells can undergo a process that we call asymmetric division. And that just simply means you have an asymmetry there when that cell divides. And the two daughter cells, if we want to call them A and B, are by intent, by programming of that stem cell, meant not to be the same. And so this is really an inherent property of many stem cells. They, they can, with the right signal, on purpose make different daughter cells when they divide. And so what this means is that when you grow a culture of cells, over time, it's going to change. And, and I think that's really an important point. And I'll, I'll touch a little bit more on that in the next slide. Another issue that really concerns me 
And again, this gets back to my own time of decades growing cells. Um, and in fact, my first job ever in science was growing cells and culture from human umbilical veins. Um, is that um, cells can get contaminated. This is really one of the toughest things we face um, when we're growing cells as scientists, and it's really frustrating. Like, you can, you can prepare a billion cells um, for an experiment, and you come in the next day, and there's, like, fungus in them, and you just, like, throw up your hands. You know, you spent all this money and time. Um, or it could be bacteria. Um, and there are other kinds of contamination, too. Um, I had a colleague who was doing an experiment a few years ago and all of a sudden, he's, he was telling me that the cells changed. You know, he wasn't sure what had happened. And it turned out he had accidentally contaminated one culture of cells with a really aggressive cancer cell line that took over the other, the other dish. And he thought it was just an interesting observation. And then he realized, whoops, you know, it was a screw-up. And they, rarely, they were not able to trace back to what their mistake was. And they're really careful, rigorous people. And so... Um, I think when you go to a non-compliant kind of context, you have to be concerned that what you're going to get back, um, if it's been lab processed, is it really pure? You know, is it just your cells? Could there be a little bit of Joe Blow's cells in there with your cells? You know, um, and that's really something to be concerned about. The other thing that worries me is that uh, most of the time, non-compliance, when they grow cells, they use something called fetal bovine serum or fetal cow serum, fetal calf serum. And um, we do this for my uh, basic science work and preclinical work as well. And the reason we do it is cells love the stuff. They just, you know, it's like, you know, an energy drink to them. You know, they just grow like crazy in the stuff. But there's really some concerns that the human cells, if they're intended for clinical use, they get coated with all of these cow antigens and stuff. And in theory, you can try to wash them off and stuff. But um, I'm not really convinced that you can get rid of all of these cow antigens, and so then if you get a transplant of those cells, you might get some kind of immune reaction. So something that you might consider talking to a physician or clinic about is, um, what are your standard operating procedures to prevent contamination and to monitor for it? And, and this is a pretty straightforward thing to ask, and a, a clinic really should have a standard protocol for saying, you know, this is how we prevent mixing of type A and type B cells and different vials. Um, because sometimes clinics might be processing cells from a number of patients simultaneously. And they should also be testing for other kinds of contamination like endotoxin, mycoplasma. These are just different kinds of pathogens. Um, and then you should also ask, you know, is the plan to grow my cells in fetal cow serum, fetal bovine serum? And, and what does that really mean for my treatment? The other thing that particularly concerns me, and, and this um, may be a big concern for me because I've been studying both stem cells and cancer cells for so long, and, um, and I'm really a believer that stem cells and cancer cells do have some things in common, and that is this idea that when you grow cells in culture, they undergo kind of a cellular evolution. So we've all you know, heard about evolution at the uh, organism level on Earth, you know, like on the Galapagos, you know, certain kind of evolution happened with birds et cetera, and you get this concept of survival of the fittest. And in fact, that can happen with cells too. We can see it in culture. And since cells divide basically about one time a day, this can happen really fast. So in, in two weeks, you can have 14 generations. You know, imagine how long it takes for 14 generations of people. But in cells, you know, this can happen just in a couple weeks. And so what happens is over time, cells change when you're growing them in the lab. They're under a lot of stress. They're on a plastic dish. You may have thrown all these goodies at them to keep them happy, but they're still under stress. They're not in a body. Um, conditions aren't the same. The oxygen's different. You know, um, All kinds of different things are not the same. And so what happens is, over time, you're selecting for a certain sort of personality of cells, I would say. Um, and the personality of cells you're selecting for maybe is not what you want to. Um, so, for example, you're selecting for cells that resist uh, the tendency to die in culture. And, and when we grow cells, a lot of them will just die over time. And, and so that's a dead end. Those cells that kind of have a hair trigger to commit suicide, they're not really going to be present very much in the population after a couple weeks. And the same thing goes for differentiation. So if we're growing stem cells, we all know that stem cells can differentiate um, and this, this can happen even spontaneously without us adding any growth factors or anything to trigger it. 
And so over time, when we grow cells in culture, you're selecting for cells that won't spontaneously differentiate. Um, cells also can grow old, just like us. And this can happen relatively quickly or slowly. And this is something we call senescence. Um, and, and when you're growing cells, you're, again, selecting against cells that grow old relatively fast. And finally, you can see at the bottom there, you're selecting for cells that grow fast over time. And this can really manifest um, in powerful ways over generations of cell growth. So even something like a 10 to 20% difference in growth rate after two weeks, um, a cell that grows 10 or 20% faster is going to be way overrepresented in the culture. So when you put all of these personality traits together, all of these things are attributes of cancer cells, unfortunately. And so what this means is that when you grow cells for even a couple of weeks in culture, it doesn't mean that stem cells are going to turn into cancer. You know, I don't think that happens very often. But it means you've kind of given them a push in that direction. And since some of those cells may reside in your body the rest of your life, we don't really, you know, it's a little bit of a higher risk thing when you've already kind of pushed them in the direction of being more like a cancer cell. So something you can talk to your uh, clinic about that you're, you know, where you're thinking about getting a treatment is, how do you validate that the cells um, that you have in your product at the end are the same as the cells, say, you took from my adipose tissue? Because a lot of times that's the claim we hear. We hear, you know, you started with a million cells. We've got a billion of your cells now. It's supercharged. You know, it's going to be a great therapy. And those billion cells are identical to the million endogenous cells that we isolated from you. So it seems to me a perfectly reasonable question to say, well, how do you know that? You know, what is your assay that tells you that that's the case? And also, how do you know that the product that you're um, going to be using, uh, infusing in me, for example, is safe? What kinds of studies do you do uh, in that area? And I wanted to bring up something I call the, the law of side effects, which I think is kind of an axiom that is really important. And that is that anything that has the potential to have a medical benefit also has the potential to have a side effect. It's just an you know, inescapable truth. And this you know, ranges from like a surgical procedure all the way down to uh, an aspirin. You know, aspirin turns out to be a very powerful drug that can have many side effects. The same is going to be true of stem cells. So if you hear someone say, you know, we've never seen any side effects, there can't be any side effects, that should really be something that you should be concerned about. And then the second point up here, the second bullet point, is that we really don't understand long term what the side effects of stem cell treatments might be. There's, there's just not a lot of good science on that. And, and by long term, I mean you know, 5, 10, 20 years after you get a treatment, could you have some kind of side effect? And the, the, the honest answer is we're just not really sure about that. And, and it could be that you may have some issue come up later, and, and we just don't know at this point. So that's kind of a gray area to keep in mind. And again, uh, unlike an aspirin, biological drugs are living. And so that means they may not entirely ever go away. So of course, an important question to ask uh, a physician in this kind of context is, what are the possible side effects? Again, if they say there aren't any, or that the worst possible outcome is that it won't work, then you should be concerned. So I already touched on this a bit, but there's some gaps in our knowledge in science that are really troubling to me. And, I, and I'll confess, these are things we really just don't understand very well. And, and this gets back to why we don't know a lot about um, the side effects long term of stem cell treatments. And that is that we don't know a lot about what happens to the cells after, say, you inject them into your vein. Um, so it's kind of a black box in the field. And, and part of the reason is that it's really hard to track stem cells uh, after you're transplanting them. And even if you have what you think is like a really uh, you know, supercharged transplant of, say, a billion cells, that's a drop in the bucket in, you know, when you think about the tens of trillions of cells in your body. So it's really hard to track cells after you get a transplant. And so there's not necessarily a lot known about this. But there is a little bit known, and I wanted to just touch upon some of the things we do know. Um, and again, some of these things, there, there can still be debate about these. It's not like they're set in stone. But these are kind of some general conclusions that many experts in the field have, have told me they, they feel pretty confident about. So the first one is that when you get an IV injection of a stem cell therapy, um, say an adipose stem cell therapy, for example, 
our body knows we're not really supposed to have adipose cells just floating around in our bloodstream. And so most of them are actually trapped in, in organs and removed from the bloodstream. This is just a natural thing our body does. And this happens predominantly in the lungs. And so most stem cells, if you get an IV injection of cells, are trapped in the lungs where they don't fare very well. It seems like most of them end up dying. Um, another thing that can happen is that stem cells, when injected into the blood, can get coated with clotting factor, and they can actually kind of be a, a catalyst for forming a clot. And again, this can end up in the lung, and a, a concern really is uh, pulmonary embolism or blood clots in your lungs. Um, there's another thing out there that I see a lot, and, and this is the idea that you can treat central nervous system disorders by injecting stem cells IV, and that some of those cells, enough of those cells, will get into the brain, say, for example, to actually have a clinically meaningful outcome. And to my understanding, there's really very little evidence that cells injected IV end up in the central nervous system. It may be the case for certain types of cells, like uh, umbilical cord blood cells, some of them may get across the blood-brain barrier. Again, I'm very skeptical that this is really a clinically meaningful number. Um, a group uh, led by Katerina LeBlanc has done some interesting autopsy studies, and they reported these last year in the journal Stem Cells. And there were two conclusions, um, at least two, there were more than two conclusions, um, that were sort of sending a mixed message. So one conclusion was they were able to detect, um, and this was an allogeneic MSC-based study, um, so they were able to detect MSCs in a number of different organs in these patients, but they didn't see any tumors. So that was sort of a positive side of it. Um, the negative side of it was that um, it looked like, consistent with the idea of most cells getting trapped in the lung, they didn't believe that there were clinically meaningful levels of cells engrafted um, in the different organs. So just, it was just like a few cells in, in organs. I think it was like one out of 100 or one out of 1,000 cells were, were from the treatment. And so they were proposing that these MSC-based treatments may work in sort of a hit-and-run kind of mechanism, kind of transient. And so I'll wrap up pretty quick here. Um, but they also saw um, pretty clear evidence that uh, in most organs, there are still transplanted cells there, and probably they're going to be there for the rest of a person's lifetime. Again, this gets to the concern those cells could do something um, that we, we don't want them to do later on. So it, I don't think it's an unreasonable question to ask, you know, what, what's going to happen to the stem cells, doctor, after you infuse them into me? And finally, I'm just going to wrap up with a couple quick slides. Um, there's a real misconception out there, I think, in the patient community that there's this sense of ownership of our cells. And I really wish that was true. I'm actually an advocate of that. But I've done some research on this. And it turns out that in most cases, once, and this applies not just to noncompliance, but also compliance in universities, once a, uh, a researcher or a physician takes cells out of your body, the current legal precedent suggests that you no longer have rights to those cells, that in fact, that commercial entity now owns those cells. And that seems to be especially true if they modify them in any way, like growing them into a, a product. So don't think that necessarily you're going to own your cells once they're taken uh, from you. And so that leads to this question you know, that you might want to ask to the clinic. You know, if there's some of my cells left over, you grow them, um, how can I go about owning those? I want to make sure I keep control of those. Um, I'll just skip that. Um, I think it's really important to ask if, you're, if the data from what's going to happen uh, in terms of your treatment is going to be published. That helps you contribute to the field and to, to the care of future patients. So you can ask about publishing. And so just to conclude, I think there's, there's not a lot of science to support a lot of what is going on in the non-compliant field. Um, but patients, I think you can educate yourselves. You can use these kinds of questions to lower risks and get more educated about what your treatment's going to be. And then I think you can make a, a better decision with your physician. So I think that's where I'll stop. Thanks. So I would um, like to maybe bring a, the roving mic up and, uh, and really just sort of let's just pretend we're in the living room having a discussion. Um, here.
Um, and we can. That's why I'm, I'm sitting on my mic. So if you didn't hear me, uh, let's just try and have a, a living room discussion here, and um, and I'm happy to start with Aubrey. Can we get the mic to uh, the Aubrey? Because the the session is being recorded, so it's not just for the benefit of hearing this audience. We we want this for posterity as well. So right right there, Aubrey, just put up your hand again. Uh, there we are. Thank you. Um, so uh, I wanted to. Um, draw attention to what I believe is a very serious omission from what's been discussed in the past hour. Uh, there's of course been an enormous amount said, and I want to emphasize that I agree with basically all of it, about risk, about the spectrum of risks that exist within, within the non-compliant universe. Um, but there's been very, very nearly zero mention of benefit, of efficacy as opposed to safety. And I feel that this is a really big problem. I feel that the way that we have the best chance of actually getting through to the general public and getting them to actually feel that we are on their side and that they should actually listen to what we say is by putting safety and efficacy on an equal footing throughout everything we say in our messaging and absolutely not making efficacy a kind of footnote to the safety considerations. It seems to me that if we, if we make that mistake, then we are in danger of looking to the public as though we are really just self-serving, that we are worried about getting struck off or worried about endorsing someone else who gets struck off and lowering our own reputation. Of course, we all know that that's not true and that the real reason why there is such an enormous emphasis on risk aversion as opposed to efficacy in not only how we conduct our work but also how we talk about our work is that society is like that, that society reacts extremely badly to very small numbers of seriously adverse events. And therefore, that in the long run, purely humanitarian considerations motivate a high emphasis on risk aversion. But still, the fact is that the people that this session is discussing, discussing with um, don't think that way. They don't think about the long-term humanitarian benefit of therapies that they are thinking about taking or not. So I think we need to, be, to bite the bullet much more and say, yes, there is just as wide a spectrum of evidence for efficacy among the non-compliant providers as there is in respect to safety. And I'd like to hear everybody's thoughts about that. So, so it's, a great, it's a great point, Aubrey, and I'll start reacting to it. I mean, I think, I, I, I guess one of the reasons why maybe, I, I, maybe we've, 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 we've erred on the side of focusing on safety rather than efficacy is because uh, you know, there's an assumption. There's there's a lot of hyperbole around uh, around efficacy in the industry. You know, there's a lot of people claiming a lot of great benefits. There's a lot of anecdotal evidence of of benefits, and even in the industry, there's a lot of excitement about the potential benefits of this. So it almost is an underlying assumption that we're all excited about the benefits of it. For one, so it's so it's so it's all it's easy to ignore because you know we all kind of assuming this is very exciting and has great potential benefits. Um, for one, but I think the more the more rigorous answer to it is that um, one of the one of the the weaknesses particularly of the non-compliant treatment providers is that they haven't invested in follow-up of patients so they don't know what works there's anecdotal stories and things on websites and occasionally a patient will write back and say thank you so much I feel so much better although a lot of those are sort of three weeks out or five weeks out or six weeks out or not three years out um, and there's not a rigorous examination of the long-term benefits and so one of the things that the, the, the industry if you can describe the non-compliant treatment providers as an industry needs to do a better job of is following up with those patients and registering the data that they glean from that in some sort of larger database of, of efficacy. And then you could start to have a, a compendium of evidence about what works and doesn't work. And if you're actually collecting data about those patients, start to, start to tie patient subgroups with results and you could, you could, you could treat this like a, like a serious science. Um, and there are doctors in this realm who are doing that. You know, Chris, Chris Centeno, love him, hate him, um, you know, laud him, applaud him, whatever. Uh, and uh, his, his fight with the FDA aside, with the litigation, is, is doing just that. He's investing, to, his, to, 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 to hear him tell it, a tremendous amount of money 
in following patients uh, and publishing the data, now I think five years out, and something upwards of 3,000 patients. There comes a point where I would suspect a compendium of data like that, even if it was collected um, from the provision of treatments which was non-compliance, becomes at some point compelling because it's, it's, it's data, it's evidence um, of, 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 of certainly of safety and, and probably of efficacy. And, and, and I think it behooves the non-compliant industry, if it wants to affect real change, to collect, to, 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 to collaborate together and start to do something like that. And there's initiatives that are trying to convince these providers to do just that. But of course, you know, there's, there's uh, as I was trying to point out earlier, a, a, a wide array of players here and some don't want, you know, some are, some don't want to invest that kind of, of, of money in, in affecting long-term change. So um, it's a very good point and I think there are things we can do about it um, or that people can do about it in the sector, but I'm eager to hear other opinions. I think it's also true that um, even amongst the compliant field that most trials fail at the efficacy phase. So I think it's easier to prove over a given period of time that something's safe. You can just say, oh, we didn't see anything bad happen. But I think it's harder to measure in a quantitative sense uh, a benefit. And so I think that could be an issue too. Uh, you know, in, in basic terms, Aubrey, you know, I, I, I agree with what you're saying and, and I understand where you're coming from. Um, you know, uh, when I'm uh, personally counseling my patients, I, I, I basically say, look, if the benefits are low and the risks are high, you don't have the procedure, you don't have the surgery, okay? If the benefits are high and the risks are low, then you go ahead and have the procedure. The difficulty is, how do you determine the benefit? And when you're doing that hedonistic calculus, and all we have right now is anecdotal evidence. The evidence-based uh, advocates will say anecdotal evidence is not real evidence-based medicine, but it is part of evidence-based medicine, and it's all we have right now. That's going to change in a little bit of time. Uh, I do think that there is promise, but again, we have to be very cautious here. Everything has to occur under careful study uh, and evaluation. I, <laughs> Hello, everybody. I would like to... To, to describe to you a situation that is happening in Italy where I'm working, probably you have heard about the situation of stamina. So this is a case already in Italy. We don't talk about a, a country which has no rules at all. So what happened? There is a, a doctor who uh, is a, was doing at least now has stopped, but it happened a whole it, there is a, a big problem, so the public opinion now is uh, doubting the patients. It's a big problem, so I would like to mention what happened. Uh, this has to do with mesenchymal stem cells, and this doctor uh, was doing um, treatment of uh, patients with rare diseases, different rare, kind of rare diseases with mesenchymal stem cells. Mesenchymal stem cells are safe, okay, they can be used but the protocol was not approved. So finally, the scientific com uh, community was um, uh, against this, uh, this protocol and they tried to stop it. And finally what happened, it stopped, but there, was, there have been transmission, TV transmissions where uh, the parents of uh, uh, newborn key, uh, babies of um, uh, little kids who would, uh, with uh, uh, with uh, diseases with with, with no with no therapy, they had seen the first uh, 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 positive results. So uh, this uh, therapy, according to them, had sto uh, stopped now, and the parents are against the decision of the ministry of the minister, who was influenced by the scientific community. So now this is a bad situation because uh, there is no confidence. I mean, something bro broke up. We, we, should have, um, we should have acted earlier. I mean, I don't, I don't understand how this, this doctor got money from the government. Somehow he got money to do these treatments. And now we are rushing and we are running after all this situation. And this is too bad. 
really too bad. So, uh, and, and, second, now what happened, the minister was influenced, of course, for political reasons by the public opinion, so she appeared in the TV and she was really, she announced that she stopped this protocol, but her, uh, let's say her body language, her face, was uh, uh, sad, something, uh, she was saying that she was actually against this decision, but since the scientific committee was saying that this is wrong, she had to decide this. And now, they are trying to uh, put in act a law um, or a rule, I don't know, to, 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 to bypass this and to decide to have what is called compassionate uh, therapies. So it means these uh, babies or these kids that were already uh, treated with mesenchymal stem cells with one dosage, they should get the second dose. So they try to bypass this and go on with the treatment because all uh, <laughs> there were mothers crying in Tivu and uh, believe me, if, if I was in their position, I would do the same. This is too late. We have to, to prevent it. We don't need to rush after. Thank you. It's an interesting story. You know, the Italian um, 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 situation is, is, is highly contextualized. There's politics, there's ethics, there's, 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 there's legal issues. Um, you know, I'm not sure um, how to comment on it specifically, but, you know, in every jurisdiction, there's the issue of, A, where you draw the line in the sand in the first place, um, and B, quite a different issue is how you enforce it. And, you know, one of the great um, um, uh, unique... Um, uh, characteristics of how this is evolving in the United States, for instance, is that there is a, a, a regulatory framework that's relatively clear, although there's a lot of ambiguity still around how it can be interpreted. But then there's the de facto situation which is being created by large uh, a lack of enforcement. And so f a lot of physicians are being emboldened to, to be creative and to push the envelope and to do things which they may even believe that are, are perfectly right, emboldened by the lack of enforcement um, against the regulatory framework that does exist. Um, and, and, and this lack of enforcement sort of uh, supports their, uh, th their cause or their, or their claim that what they're doing is compliant. Um, and so you create this anomaly of what's technically compliant or not, and, but, but practically what's compliant. And, um, and that creates a lot of confusion in the public as well, um, not only here in the U.S., but in, in many other countries. I saw some other hands up here in the uh, front as well, so many... I had a question for Dr. Wu, um, and this is maybe a question about the broader medical establishment and how, at least in our particular state, we've seen the growth in the non-compliant clinics, not among specialists, not among orthopedic surgeons or cosmetic surgeons, but more family practice physicians opening up standalone clinics. And so I was kind of curious on your take on that and the take within the medical establishment of people who aren't specialists working in the specialist fields using stem cells. Well, I think that uh, if, if they're trying to use regenerative therapies uh, in conjunction with a specialist, that uh, that that is not um, a necessarily a bad model. Okay, uh, a a generalist that comes along and says that I can fix everything, that's concerning to, to all of us, including us physicians and surgeons. And and, and I think that um, uh, a clinician in good conscience would should know when they're in over their heads. I would never, ever imagine uh, trying to be uh, a specialist in neurology or Alzheimer's or Parkinson's. Exactly, exactly. And, and, and I think that, um, you know, it's not just about, you know, doing it. Doing it in the procedure is pretty straightforward now, okay? It's not necessarily rocket science, but it's the question of perioperative care. You know, if you don't have the perioperative subspecialization and capability to carry somebody through not just the immediate procedure but also later on for the long-term follow-up. If you don't have the ability to carry somebody through safely, you really shouldn't be doing that procedure in the first place. And that's generally what's taught within our medical schools, okay? So, 
you know, in saying that, however, uh, I will say this. Uh, one of the things that, that doesn't get covered at the, these conferences is that there, there is a tremendous amount of regulatory issues that, that are hidden behind the, the, uh, the, the state medical boards. And, and these physicians do have to answer to uh, morbidity and mortality conferences at their hospitals. They have to be able to maintain their malpractice insurance. Uh, and they also uh, have to be able to maintain their hospital privileges and uh, stay in, on good terms with their state medical boards. Uh, four ways in which that can be uh, a safety net uh, to protect patients. But I, I agree with you. I think that it really does need to be along the lines of subspecialization. And it's a challenge for patients to figure out when someone you know, d says they're a specialist but they're not board certified. I think for the lay public, that's a real challenge to figure out, well, really, what is your training? Uh, um, it's confusing. I mean, it's confusing for people like me that work in it every day. For the average Joe Smith, they don't understand what to even ask. Yeah, that's a very good point because um, every, um, every state has some pretty serious regulations regarding use of the word board certified in. And for the clinicians in the room, you know, make sure you go back to your respective states and figure out what those laws are. Because in the state of California, they have a predefined list that uh, is allowed. So you've got to be very careful about how you advertise yourself. And again, it's not binary. You know, it's not all about you're either boards you're certified in this particular area or else you're no good at all. There's lots of people who learn lots of things, you know, by lots of legitimate means. But, you know, again, it comes back to Alan's, you know, degree of common sense. A weekend course at the Holiday Inn on, on how to process fat is not is probably not something you want to entrust your life in. Yeah, and I would also just point out um, that I think physician training in stem cells and regenerative medicine is really an important area. And um, earlier this year, I proposed that um, med schools and, and other hospitals start having one year sort of like subspecialty or fellowship training in cellular and stem cell based regenerative medicine. And I got tons of response from physicians saying they would love to actually be able to take that training, but not a single institution has really stepped up to provide that kind of training, and I think that's really essential. I agree. Question here, and then we're, we'll try and get to lots of them, so let's try and be brief in each of our questions. Um, hi, I'm Mary Pat Moyer, and I'm, I have an industry perspective. Um, I'm the CEO and Chief Science Officer of Incel Corporation in San Antonio, and patients come to us because they know we're working on the development of therapies that will have efficacy and will work with specialists for each of the different diseases. And what breaks my heart is that the patients come to us for uh, reasons like they've been um, treated poorly in some place, or they come and they say, well, I was treated with stem cells in the past, and they worked, and then I went to this place and they charged me $50,000, and now they don't work, and oh, by the way, they were put into a biorepository, and can you put them in your biorepository? I want them transferred over. And I say, no, hell no. If I can't trust the quality control that was done in another biorepository, I can't bring those cells into my operation because we follow the FDA regulations. We follow the rules. And there's a responsibility for those of us who are in industry to follow the rules, just like there is for the folks who are in the medical profession or research or all of us who are activists. And I'm an activist because my husband has end-stage liver disease and he's on the liver transplant list. And I care deeply that we do the right thing. And people will say, well, Mary Pat, I know I'm supposed to keep it short. Mary Pat, why aren't you getting your stem cells into your husband? And I says, because it's not time yet. It's not ready. We haven't done the study until he's on the clinical trial. I'm not going to just go inject him in, at home in the kitchen. But I've heard stories of people going to Belize and being in a tent with tarantulas. I've heard stories of people being in all kinds of situations. So what can the patients ask? Because I ask the patients this when they tell me we had an effect. How many cells are you receiving and do the people who are providing those cells to you know how to count them? We laugh, all of us, but it's a serious, serious issue in this, in this field, especially with fat-derived cells. If they tell you you're in a study and you have no baseline work done, and you have nobody following you, you are not in a study. If you didn't sign something that said it was a study, you are not in a study. They're just running a con on you. It happens. 
I suspect there's folks in here that this has happened too. So you have to ask those questions. How are you going to follow me? What is your quality control? And there's a big risk of people manufacturing in their offices. We're a manufacturer. Our quality control is tight. Trained people, et cetera, et cetera. Someone with a little bag of cells, that, and if they put it into your IV, do they know what they're doing? Do they have any idea? Now, I trained medical students for 20 years, and um, a lot of them didn't want to be in the cell biology lectures because they wanted to get to patients faster. And now they need to go back and learn the biology they should have learned along the way. So we're in an interesting time. So my point is, is that those of us who are trying to do the right thing and don't think that if we're an industry, it's all about the money, because it isn't. It's all about getting things out there to help people. But you have to ask the right questions if you're the patient. Um, don't let someone just hand you something. So that's my point. And Mary Pat did an interesting study recently, you know, looking at the various cell counts that were alleged to come out of different devices and found that you know, some of the claims of the number of cells um, were outrageously wrong. So you know, there's, you know, it's, it's, it's very easy to, 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 to do that. And those are the kinds of studies that are very, very important. So thanks, Mary Pat, but let's move on. and comment on something because we all uh, realize PharmD is going to be threatened by this uh, regenerative biological revolution and eventually they're going to be very recalcitrant towards this type of uh, protocols because it will pretty much replace their 19th century, 20th, 20th century model of taking some type of agent hitting at the cell receptor and hoping for some type of miraculous outcome because we all know that particular paradigm in terms of a scientific model is TKO. It's done. It doesn't exist. There are so many other factors. So this biological revolution will most likely be impeded uh, by PharmD because PharmD is going to lose. I'll just, I'll just stop you there. I just don't buy it. If Pharma is not scared of therapies that work. So, uh, well, you know, how are they so, going to so, make so, money on it? So, 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 so I mean, I mean, how are they going to make billions of dollars on using uh, biologics that are actually uh, because they're not geared up for it? There's lots of ways. There's lots of ways that cell-based treatments are going to going to make patients better. Well, some of it's going to be make some of it's going to be practice of medicine, and pharmas doesn't involve themselves in that. And that's and if that's and if that's the only way cell-based treatments work then, yeah, I agree, pharma's not going to be involved, and it's going to be physicians, it's going to be standard of medicine, this is going to be great. But there's lots of ways that pharma's investing in cell-based treatments that they're very excited about, that they manufacture, they create into a product, they industrialize, they commercialize, and, they're, and, they're, and they're, 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 they intend to make lots of money by products which have cells in them. So, so, and, 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 and so pharma's investing in it. They're excited about it. Not every, not every cell-based treatment's gonna be a, a pharmaceutical product, but neither is, 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 is pharma not gonna have any involvement in it. I'm from a developing country where the, there are many fine hospitals, and the Department of Health recently ruled out uh, ruled that only accredited hospitals could provide stem cell treatments. Now, uh, the problem is, as I'm learning in this conference, um, every patient, it seems like, should be part of a clinical study. But a developing country like where I'm from, they have no money for clinical studies. And so uh, there is a company that is promoting um, they are using a plastic surgeon, a, a board certified plastic surgeon, to conduct uh, training of surgeons in autologous adipose tissue, uh, adipose stem cells, where the surgeon that's trained will bring five patients, and uh, each patient, uh, the under supervision of the plastic surgeon trainer the surgeon trainee will extract, let's say, 10 cc of fat from below the navel and process it, and the company has this. They provide all the equipment, all the supplies, and uh, they have this color 
machine that is supposed to activate more of the stem cells from the adipose tissue. And then the stem cells are injected IV into the patient, and the patient goes home in three hours. So the question is, what should be the stand on this autologous three-hour treatment? Should we wait until the wizards of the world will pronounce that this is uh, an approved treatment? And because we cannot afford a clinical trial, so what's what should we do? That's well, I'm sorry question. if you take away from the from the session that, that we think you know all, uh, everything legitimate should be in a clinical trial. I've tried to be open on that subject. I mean, there's I think that there's 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 lots of great work being done in non-compliant treatments, and our, you know it's a, it's, a, it's a, I think we should try and find ways to de-risk it for patients, um, and, and and to collect efficacy data to make sure that they're as safe as possible. Um, but you know, the one thing, big thing you've missed out of your statement is for the treatment of what? Well, very specifically for um, osteoarthritis and severe allergies. Right. So, you know, there's many questions, I guess, that, that, that anyone would ask, I think, of something like that. What is the device? What, you know, how, how does it work? What is the activation of these cells, this mysterious activation of these cells? What does the cell product look like? Um, who are the practicing, you know, plastic surgeons, okay, they're good with getting fat out, but what, for the treatment of what, and this is to Alan's point, you know, how are you, how are you taking care of those patients afterwards? Um, who are processing, you know, how are the, are the cells just, is it a closed system? Do they go in and out completely in that device? Does, that, does the device have regulatory approval? So there's a lot of questions. I don't think you should, anybody should, should, should say it's okay or anybody should say not okay based on the very limited amount of data, including patients that you've said in your statement. But I, it would be my initial reaction. I think that regenerative medicine poses a, a, a unique quandary in that is there the possibility that a country that does not have many financial resources, instead of buying drugs and medicines all the time, potentially use the patient's own cells to, for a low cost, treat the patients. Um, and that hedonistic calculus that we have to go through as a society can only be judged by you know, your own country. Uh, but I will say this, um, the, when we're talking about keeping things out in the open and in public, uh, the fear that, we ha that, that I have is you know, we don't want to have private doctors sequestering the charts and hiding the charts and, and, and putting away the complications and burying them. We need to, we need to have that out in the open. So although you, if, you, if you can't afford a study, although in the Philippines you've got a lot of nurses, uh, you could probably train the nurses to actually collect data and at least keep the charts out in the open, incorporate it into your morbidity and mortality conference within your hospital, and leave the data out in the open, and at least uh, try to look at the patients that have reached a terminal end where there are no other standard surgical options within your country. Uh, uh, before you treat just anybody randomly. I'm so, uh, sorry, we got, we've got to cut it. I think we've got probably obligations too. So I, I appreciate um, the fact that there's lots more questions and I wish we could keep going, but I suspect we need to get the room to the next, uh, to the next session. So I hope it's been uh, even ever so slightly useful.